Perhaps not everyone knows this, but most of the buildings in the historic center of Venice actually rest on millions of wooden piles that were driven into the ground over a thousand years ago. But how is that possible? Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. Venice rises up out of a lagoon and beneath the city, there are more than a hundred small islands naturally separated by canals, also known as Ri, which we can still see today. This is why Venice has a whopping 438 bridges. However, it's a swampy environment with relatively shallow water, and more importantly, the ground is not ideal for construction because it's unstable. So, how did they manage to build such an important city here? To understand this, we need to take a closer look at the subsurface. It's composed of a number of different layers. On top, we have a layer of backfill, which is essentially a layer of soil that was artificially added by humans at some point in time. Below this, there are layers of soft clay, followed by a further layer of clay of a stronger consistency, which is technically referred to as an overconsolidated clay. This layer is called Caranto, and it's found at a depth of 4 to 5 meters, and is between 1 and 3 meters thick. This is precisely where the wooden piles come into play. In fact, the Caranto, although harder than the layers above it, would not be able to support the load of a building on its own. And for this reason, already in the early Christian period, they decided to make it more compact by driving large numbers of wooden poles, called piles, into it. The ground became more stable, making it better suited for building construction. First, the top layers of soil were removed. Then the piles were sharpened and driven into the ground. They were literally hammered into the clay. From a technical standpoint, this allowed for strong lateral friction between the pile and the soil, ensuring stability. What's more, as the wood was completely covered by a layer of soil, it basically didn't rot. However, keep that aspect in mind, and we'll focus on it again shortly. To give you a few more details about these piles, they usually had a diameter of between 10 and 25 centimeters, and a length ranging from 1 to 3 and a half meters. Obviously, larger piles were used to support heavier buildings. During the early stages of the construction of Venice, they mostly used local woods such as elm, oak, and ash, but over time, especially for more important buildings, larger piles made of fir, larch, and pine were used. These came from mountainous areas, such as Trentino Alto Adige, and were transported on rafts via the main rivers in the area. But how many piles are we talking about? Building the city of Venice took millions of piles, although I haven't actually been able to find an exact count. However, to give you an idea, for the foundations of the Rialto Bridge, they used 6,000 piles, which were 3.47 meters long and had a diameter of between 11 and 23 centimeters. And there were about 25 piles per square meter. But it doesn't end there because on top of the piles there was a layer of intersecting wooden beams, and on top of that, a stone brickwork level was built. In fact, this brick layer was the only level that came into contact with the water of the lagoon, and that's still the case today. As I mentioned previously, an ingenious aspect of these foundations is that the piles are exposed to neither air nor water. The piles are completely immersed in this thick muddy layer where aerobic bacteria, which require oxygen and could damage the wood, cannot survive. Consider that they have been so well preserved that analyses conducted on elm and beech piles from under the bell tower of St. Mark's dated them back to the year 970 CE, meaning that they are over a thousand years old. For this reason, it is said that the piles of Venice are eternal. However, this is not entirely true. There are a number of research entities, like Carilla, the CNR, and several universities that have studied the wood decay phenomenon, and they've realized that, while it's true that there are no aerobic bacteria in the mud, there are anaerobic bacteria, which do not need oxygen. Well, these actually do damage the wood, although given the particular context, this happens very, very slowly, especially for conifer wood. However, this is not an insurmountable problem. 
In fact, for years now, they've been carrying out wooden foundation reinforcement work. And alternative, more modern foundations are becoming increasingly common, especially for new constructions. These use materials that are more resistant in this environment, such as concrete. Obviously, even though the wooden piles do not come into direct contact with the water, there is still a problem for the buildings, as the bricks that do come into contact with the water can indeed be affected. The salty water can rise up into the bricks, which soak it up like sponges. At this point, the water evaporates and leaves behind deposits of sodium chloride, or salt, inside the bricks. Over time, the salt swells and the bricks crack. For this reason, a layer that acts as a barrier is often added, and this prevents moisture from rising. There are various technical fixes, but one of the most traditional solutions is the use of Istrian stone, which is a very dense, low-porosity limestone that prevents water from rising above it. If you look carefully, you'll still see it in Venetian houses today. All right, guys, thanks for watching up to this point. I hope you enjoyed it, and please make sure you share it with all the Venetians you know. I'll see you for the next video, always here on Geopop Everyday Science.